I didn't until I went to seminary have a uh, a very accurate reflection, understanding, picture, grasp, handle, whatever word you want to put on it, on the sacraments. And the more I travel around the church, generally speaking, um, I think in some ways that's true of God's people. And so every month, the first of the month since I've been here, and if you uh, had privilege to see our teaching and preaching calendar that Kevin and I work from, um, you would see that the first of the month, the only topic, no matter where we are, the only topic is focus on the Eucharist. And so today is the first of the month, and it is no different than that is a strange scripture uh, today. You may put it up there if you would like, sir. Uh, In fact, it's just a simple verse. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. If you know it from Matthew chapter 27, the entire 27th chapter of Matthew talks about Jesus being arrested. And he's on his way to Jerusalem and he is done all his things he needs to do and he's been well he's been arrested we saw Judas a few weeks ago in our series and he's been brought before Pilate just a little context for this particular verse just a few moments ago if you're looking in the 27th chapter of Matthew uh, and in the 27th verse it says and then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters And they gathered the whole battalion before him. You go on to read there. It tells you about how basically Jesus, the Savior of the world, is subjected to a hazing incident. Some people would argue that it's between three and six hundred people. The whole battalion of troops gather around Pilate's house. They see this guy they've heard about. Everybody's heard about him by this point. As Kevin pointed out when we were talking the other day, a reputation tends to follow you. And everywhere Jesus has gone at this point, these people just show up. And it's because they know this name that's above all names. Soldiers aren't any different. And so what happens is this thing that tends to happen around we men, I don't know if it's testosterone, I don't know if it's just plain immaturity. I don't know what it is. But can you imagine being the sole person in amongst 300 to 600 people and the whole objective is just to absolutely embarrass you? Some of you sitting in this room are going, yeah, we call that high school in my day. You get the feeling? Have you ever been to a place where the entirety, you feel like the brunt of, of the brunt force of everything is just to make you look foolish? Oh, they, I'm sure they had plenty to say. In fact, if you read in the gospel, it says they do. Hail, king, smack him in the side of the head. You can probably imagine some of the other commentaries. I bet you've heard it before. We live in a world where everybody's got something to say. In Jesus' world ain't no different. When you go on and read down in the 27th chapter, and it's not just this group of, of soldiers giving him grief, where they conscript a man into service and they take him to Golgotha, uh, which is a place that, um, I don't know, it's not very big at all. It's got a big church built around it now. Um, but there's this, it's a little bitty place, really. And so they can script a man into service to help him take Jesus there. And they get him, they get him onto the, onto the cross, however they do it. Ours is one where we're reminded that he's nailed to the cross. As Kevin and I were talking this week, said, you know, a man who's been in the construction business as long as I have, I've been hit with a sledgehammer. 
I've hit people with one, sometimes on purpose. But I've been hit with one. And I don't really understand how it is. If, if you put a man's arms out like this, you got this spike in your hand, and if you'll take a pencil or pen, push that, push that in your hand. I said, you know, when you're driving stobs, it's easy just to take a stob and you tap it a few times and get it started. You can take your hands off of it and you can get back and give it all you got to get a good blow against it. Can't do that, hand. It won't stand up. And so somehow, this group of men who they sat down and kept watch over him there, Somehow this group of five men, John tells us it was four, they divided his garment into four pieces, one per soldier, and then we're going to find out there's another in just a minute, five of them on this place. You imagine one of them holding the nail and the other one taking the mallet? Can I sign up for that job? For beloved, today is a day where we vividly re remind ourselves and are reminded of love's most openly defiant act. And so to, to have a group of soldiers stand there to get Jesus attached to the cross, and then once they do and get him up, they sat down and kept watch over him there. Here's my frustration with this text. Is the whole point we're going to deal with it a little bit today. And they never say a thing. Love's most openly defiant act in the history of all time. And they never say a word. They never say a word. They're there to do what most of us consider to be the most heinous thing anybody could ever invite you to do. And they never say a word. What do you make out of that? You make that this man's in front of you. And these four men just sit on the hill. They, they sit down across from him. How's that? They sit down across from him. And they never say anything. Maybe it's the case. They don't say anything. Because maybe it is that part of the contingent, like this, this is just normal. How is it that you live in a world that that, that crucifying someone just becomes normal. Go and flip the TV on today. That question might still be valid. Read the paper. Watch what happens to your football coach on Monday. That question might still be valid. How is it that we've come to an environment we're completely crucifying somebody and no one even no one even drops the eggs off their fork. It could be that it's just become normal for the men. They get up, they're in the barracks, they see the hazing incident, and they see him, they see Jesus ridiculed and beaten, and oh, it's kind of a yawn fest. And they look around and they hear someone say, Joe, Jeff, Bill. Come on, you got crucifixion duty today. Hmm, okay. Could it be something that this heinous can just become routine? I mean, how do you just sit there? And never say a word. Maybe the case is, though. Maybe they don't say a word because maybe they're as uncomfortable with it as we are. 
maybe they just they sit there and they're trying to make sense of love's most openly defiant act for the proverbs say that that group of people who everybody came by and you remember this story right the scribes come by the passers by come by and look at Jesus while these same guards are sitting there exercising their right to remain silent everybody else got something to say right told us you were going to destroy the temple in three days and rebuild it you can't even get yourself off the cross criminals on either side of him you know the tale from Luke one berates Jesus the other beseeches him for blessing elders and chief priests come by king of the Jews aren't you yep but maybe they don't say anything because they're as uncomfortable as any of us would be for the Proverbs say that it is a fool that gives full vent to his spirit but it's the wise person it's the wise person that quietly keeps silent what do you do everybody else comes by and looks at what's going on here and goes king I always want to get into the text and ask them this particular thing don't you think that you should understand before you disagree don't you isn't that isn't that really isn't that really what's at stake here? Shouldn't you be able to understand what's going on before you can even agree with it or disagree with it? Shouldn't you understand what's going on? Beloved, I would contend with you that the silence might actually underscore the fact that the smartest men in the whole, you, are the ones who sat down across from him and kept watching and never said a word. And so what about you? As you sit down this morning, because something happens when we celebrate in communion together, when we celebrate the Eucharist together, it's not just cool bread and welches. As God in some way inhabits this space and reminds us to celebrate this this most openly defiant act of love and when we do he'll be faithful to meet us here so in a way that I can't explain to you in a way that you probably don't understand either and that's okay the man we sing about the name that's above all names the one who saves us and frees us and heals us and preaches and teaches is here in our midst in this most strange way here and so what do you do when once again you're confronted with love's most openly defiant act what do you do for today friends is an invitation it's an invitation to Maybe be okay to sit there and to never say a word. For I would say that these are probably the most reflective persons in the view. So you have to, every one of us has to grapple with the fact that that Jesus presents his power and his redemptive glory in ways that we just don't fully understand how is it that how is it that a king would be held high on a cross how is it that that death can trample down death how is that and each of us have to grapple with that deeply as we sit across from him and 
and behold the most openly defiant act in history on love's behalf. You do. I got it in my mind here. And you know what happens in that mind. I got it in my mind here that there's some really, some really deep stuff going on. Well, if you'll remember from the Gospel of Matthew earlier, in chapter 8, Jesus is on his way with his friends. And this centurion comes out to meet him. He says, Lord, my servant's sick. Can you heal him? Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. He says, all right, I'll go with you. He says, no, 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 no. You don't have to come with me. Just say the word, and he'll be healed. Oh, okay. What's that got to do with this? I wonder. In my mind, I've got it wired up. Could it be for no group of men would go to guard people that had been crucified without a centurion could it be that the absolute same man who had met Jesus before who actually traded on Jesus's power and authority now finds himself in the position of overseeing the death of the very one that healed his own servant could that be why he has nothing to say could it be that these four men that are on the, on the hill there, sitting down across from Jesus, keeping watch over him, and as I've pointed out enough now, never said a word? Could it be that this centurion, could it be that one of the men in this group was actually the one that at Jesus' word he was healed? What do you do with the fact that there might be a greater than good chance that someone who has been restored by the power of the living God now sits down across from him and oversees his execution. So how could that happen? Maybe they're as uncomfortable with it as any of us would be. Friends, most of my journey in spirituality has been the same thing. Feeling like I knew this Jesus guy. And as Paul writes, finding myself sat down across from him, crucifying him afresh. Every time I didn't do what he wanted me to do, every time I just chose not to want what Jesus wanted, and chose what I wanted more than what he wanted. I feel like the gang on the hill that sat down across from him and never said a word. But what do you say to a man like that? What's more, I always wonder why Jesus doesn't have something to say. As he looks upon maybe men that are under authority, maybe men who didn't have any choice in the matter, maybe men who did. What if he's looking upon men of faith? For if the centurion is the same guy, Jesus hadn't forgot that face. And now to see him looking him back in his own eyes from the cross, Jesus recognizes the man that he's healed, sat down across from him with a quarter of his garment, the spoils of crucifying the living God. How does Jesus have nothing to say? Hmm. 
for it's a conspiracy of silence. And the silent word of God speaks loud and clear. For it seems to me that everyone in view, you, them, all of us, have to raise the question, do we really understand what's going on? Does Jesus have to put it in words? Or does he have to just put it in a form that is unequivocal? It makes no sense that the Lord of life would give his life for someone. It doesn't. However, the Lord of life gave his life for everyone. And why he's doing it, this group of men sit there on the hill and never say a word. What say you? You sat down from across from the Lord of life. Would you remain silent? Would you confess the fear that would be deep in your heart? Lord, I wanted no part of this. Would you confess the anxiety of, I'm not sure what's going on? For if you were across from him, what would you say? For in love's most openly defiant act, he has issued an invitation to all of us. And the invitation is, has God put his love in a form that you and I can understand? Has he put it in a form that says, before your very eyes, as you sat down across from him, has he put in a form that says, this is life given for the life of the world. What? Has he put it in a form that we can understand? That would spill his own blood for the redemption of all love in its most openly defiant act said this is the cup of salvation drink from it friends has he in the elements put things in such a way that you and I can understand the hill, on the hill, across from the Lord of life. They sat down and kept watch over him there. And they never said a word. They never said a word. as you prepare to share in the elements this morning. Eucharist, Thanksgiving, is an opportunity to grapple with that very thing. You sit down 
cross from the Lord of life. Maybe their heart cried aloud. Maybe the silence spoke louder than any words they could say. I don't know. But when we celebrate together and as you share in the elements, it's an opportunity. If the Spirit of God compels you, it's an opportunity not to stay silent if you need not be silent. It's an opportunity to receive His grace and be thankful if you're just not sure what to make out of it. And it's an opportunity to remind yourself again and be reminded through love's most openly defined act that he gave his life for the very persons who took it. He wouldn't have me. <laughs> oh, yes, he would. And so I don't know what you do as you sit there this morning across from him. Having sat down there and kept watch over him, I don't know what you do with this man. But I know what your invitation is. Your invitation is to take and eat for this is the bread of life given for you. Your invitation is to drink this, all of you, for this is the cup of salvation. And whether that comes with words or not, I don't know. Those of you who are serving this morning, would you mind to come forward?